Well, I'm going to start off by reading some scripture. If you want to follow along, it's going to come out of Matthew 18. I'm going to start in verse 21 and read on, at least in my Bible, to the other side of the page, all the way um, to verse 35 there. Matthew 18, and you'll see it up on the screen as well. This is the parable of the unforgiving ser servant, and you probably know this one, so if you don't have a Bible, there are some in the pews, there's some in the welcome center that you're welcome to take home. Uh, iPads, iPhones, Android, you can look it up in version is a really good Bible app if you don't have a Bible app for your Bible. But I'm gonna read here, and this is the parable of the unforgiving servant. It says, then Peter came up to Jesus and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle his accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, the master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Verse 27, and out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the, him the debt. But when that same servant went out from where they were, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe. So this fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. Yet he refused, and he went and he put him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all of your debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy upon you? And in anger, the master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all of his debts. Verse 35, so also my heavenly father will do to each and every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Well, we had a, a great day, Ruthel put something up on the screen here yesterday. My family and I went over to Brainerd and we were thinking we might escape the, the, the bad weather. So we had a water park day over in Brainerd at Arrowwood and um, went and played video games and slides and water and fun and, and all that. And one of the things I got yesterday was this, this glass. And actually, I'm a little, a little thirsty. I, Kevin, I, would you grab my cup? I forgot it down there. Thanks. Um, so, so, so I get this cup and it's like this I mean, you can see it's this beautiful, wonderful cup. Oh, oh, Kevin, what did you do? Some of it's still okay here. Oh, man, uh, it's everywhere. Easy come, easy go. Oh, well, you know how much time went into doing that? It, it was a lot of work. <laughs> All right, well, accidents happen, I guess. <laughs> My goodness. Okay, well, well, man, I heart dad. Now you're probably wondering, why do we just do that? Seems a little awkward and weird way to start off a sermon, huh? <laughs> and you see, I have a choice of whether I will forgive Kevin or not. Right? I mean, I can ask him to, to replace this somehow. <laughs> I don't know if his artistry skills are up to that level. <laughs> or he could just refuse and say, I'm, I'm, I was helping you out, buddy. I was bringing you something to drink. It's, I'm not culpable. It's not my fault. I mean, I, yeah, I stumbled, but it happens. I mean, accidents happen, right? I was just helping you out. But even if I forgive him, I mean... Kind of precious, isn't it? Valuable. I mean, the cost doesn't just vanish. And I'd still have to pay to, to replace it. And then I'd have to get out my markers and make it like I made the first one. <laughs> my son didn't make it. And I want to say that this 
is the dilemma, however, of forgiveness. It's the dilemma of forgiveness. Who pays the debt? Right? The problem is that many times the things around us in our world are, are much more valuable than this little glass I got at Target last night. We have much more valuable things in our lives, much more valuable pieces of property, things that are far more valuable that, that frankly many of us have lost and now there's a debt. It could be a relationship, it could be a job, it could be our reputation, it could be even our self-esteem. So we wonder how are we going to pay for that debt? And you know, we might say, well, yeah, you know, my marriage, it ended 10 years ago, but I'm still angry at my ex. I still hold them liable for it. Or maybe you have a, a family member or a friend who hurt you deeply, and because of their words or because of their actions, you still hold on to that pain. Or there's a colleague or maybe a boss or, or, or somebody in your business who's betrayed you, and it cost you, maybe it cost you a promotion, maybe it cost you a job, or maybe not just a, a good opportunity. So what do you do? Many times we continue to curse them. A parent may have abused you. And you were justified to have pain from that. But maybe you haven't healed from that. Folks, we all have debts all around us. But the question we have before us is this. Will we forgive them? Can we forgive them? Do I even have to forgive them? Dr. Karen Schwartz, uh, a doctor, works at Johns Hopkins Med Medical University, one of the greatest places if you're sick to go in the entire world. She says that when we don't forgive, it not only affects us relationally, but it also affects us physically. She says this, she says, chronic anger from unforgiveness puts you into a fight or flight mode, which results in numerous changes in heart rate, blood pressure, and immune response. Those changes, she says, then increase the risk of depression, heart disease, and diabetes, among other conditions. And she is an expert in this field. Beyond the physical things that happen when we don't forgive a debt, there is something that is even more threatening that is a threat to our hearts. How many of you have ever drank poison before? How many of you would like to drink poison? No, we wouldn't, right? But day after day after day, many of us are drinking the poison of bitterness, resentment, and hatred. Because what we are saying in the moment is we are saying to ourselves, why, why, why do I have to forgive when it was them who made the hurt? I get pain, they get freedom, right? And so every day then we continue drinking the poison of bitterness, the poison of resentment, of hatred each and every day, hoping that as we drink that poison, hoping as we take it in, hoping as I drink that poison that it will hurt them hoping it might even kill them so they will get what they deserve. But in the end, we're the only one drinking the poison. And it is slowly killing us. Well, as we continue in this series, Modern Family Vintage Values. We kind of have the living room set up here. Welcome to my living room at Glory Baptist Church. You see, the modern family has a great many problems and challenges in front of it. But the good, good news is that God's Word also speaks to us and brings us truth and guides us when it comes to this idea of forgiveness. You see, forgiveness is God's idea. Most of us on our own, we wouldn't come up with it. Forgiveness is God's idea. And when we follow God's will and plan for our lives, our relationships are healthier and stronger. And one of those uh, crucial and, and critical areas is forgiveness. 
in our marriages, with our kids, with our parents, our brothers, our sisters, aunts, uncles, neighbors, co-workers, with our classmates, our church members, uh, everyone. Can we take a step towards forgiveness when the thing is there broken on the ground? Or will we continue to drink the poison? Well, as we begin, I want to give you the first step towards forgiveness. Someone once said that the first step towards forgiveness is to understand that the other person is a complete and total idiot. Right? That's always the case, right? You can write that down. Complete, totally. Pastor said so. It's got to be true. Where's it in the Bible? There's people flipping through the pages. It's in there somewhere, isn't it? No, it's not. That's not the case. But we laugh because in the moment, that's kind of how we feel, right? Even when we know better. And I say that because interestingly, as we look at this passage, we have good old Peter, right? Peter, the one who, who, who was ready, shoot, aim when it came to saying things, right? It, just, it came out of him without much filtering. That's kind of who, it seems, by reading scripture, Peter was. And it makes him very relatable. I love the guy. I do. And so Peter... He asked this question in Matthew 18, starting in 21. He says, Lord, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I have to forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus says, not seven, Peter, but seven, 70 times seven, right? And as I looked at this passage, I'm thinking, not only do I have to forgive, but now I've got to do math. What's up with that? You see, Jesus has a point here. And the point was that back in his day in Judaism, you forgave three times. Three times, that's it. Now we say, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me, right? So now we're down to two in our culture. But back in this day of Jesus, you forgive somebody three times. But on the fourth, they're out of luck, no more. You don't have to forgive them any. They're, They're just... Complete total idiots, like I said. So Peter is trying to be generous here. He's saying, how about seven times, Jesus? Isn't that enough? And as we see here, Jesus isn't actually interested whatsoever in the number. He's more interested in our hearts. His interest is in forgiveness. Jesus is saying, don't limit your forgiveness. Let's say that together, would you? Don't limit your forgiveness. If you hear nothing else today, remember those words. Honestly, if we went around the room here today, we would say, that's a lot easier said than done. Thank each and every one of us probably. And for some of us, this is so extremely difficult because some of us have been hurt deeply. So deeply that it's even... It's hard to even think about forgiveness. So we hold on to that painful memory, that experience, that that careless word, that action, that that, that void of somebody abandoning us, or or how we were betrayed, or or what was done to us. We we hold on to this grudge, somebody at church or somebody at work, and and we we just try to avoid them because we can't deal with it anymore, right? And, 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 and in fact, some of us are even, some of us are still holding on to things, still trying to hold somebody accountable who's been dead for years. Is Jesus saying to us, well, we just need to be, you know, literally like doormats for everybody? That they can just walk all over us? No, he's not saying that. But he is calling us to forgive. He's saying we shouldn't hold back from forgiving. But he's also not saying that we should forget. And there's an important difference in that. We've all likely heard of forgiving but not forgetting. That's probably not new to any of us. But there's a reason we don't forget. Back when I was young, I must have been, oh, I suppose I was about ten. Nine or ten would be my guess. 
Love to ride motorcycles. I got my first motorcycle for Christmas when I was four. Okay? Literally. I had a, a motorcycle before I had a bicycle. Loved that little motorcycle. And so, for vacation, we would go out to the Black Hills of South Dakota. My dad was a motorcycle mechanic, you need to understand, as I was growing up in my younger years. So he worked at a cycle shop, and we would go out to the Black Hills of South Dakota, and we'd go to the Sturges Rally, and uh, we would camp with all my relatives. If you've ever been in the Black Hills, a little place called Nemo, and back in Box Elder Creek Campground, beautiful, amazing little slice of heaven in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And, and around there, there's all sorts of back roads and logging trails and all kinds of great places to ride dirt bikes. And so we would put the dirt bikes in the trailer and pull them behind the family car and get out there. We, we tent camped. We were hardcore campers, right? Uh, my brother was born uh, July 19th. Sturgis Rally is the first week of August. He slept in a suitcase with a can of pork and beans to keep it from closing and suffocating him. That's where he stayed. We were serious. And that was also all the money we had to, to get the campground site. So, we'd love to go riding on the motorcycles. And one day we'd ridden for hours. We'd come back and, and got off the bikes. And when we rode, you know, we, we wear helmets and we're smart and, and we're protective gear. And we got back to camp and, you know, it was a hot summer day in August in South Dakota. And so I quick went and changed back into my shorts and wasn't really paying as close of attention as I should be. And I, and I went over next to my motorcycle and I got too close to it and psh, hit my leg up against that just smoking hot pipe. We'd been riding for hours. That pipe was blisteringly hot. So I, I still carry a scar to this day on my shin where I hit the motorcycle's pipe. Now, I have never had to learn that lesson again. <laughs> my dad had warned me I knew the consequences if it were to happen. Well, it happened, and I've never done it again. When we are hurt by something, we are wise to learn from it, aren't we? And so what Jesus is saying, yes, forgive, but there's a reason that we don't forget because of our pain. But in those moments, when we think about those things in our lives that are, that are broken and shattered... When there's a debt to pay, we need to be a people who then pardon. We need to be a people who then forgive those who have wronged us. Forgive those who have hurt us. Forgive those who have damaged us. Are we a people of forgiveness? Many of you know who Charles Stanley is. And he said this. He said, to forgive is to give up all claims to punish or exact a penalty for an offense. No strings or conditions can be attached or else it ceases to be a pardon. So when it comes to forgiveness, Jesus is inviting you and me into this idea of forgiveness. To, to cut those strings, to cut those conditions, to get rid of expectations. He's inviting us to not hold on and justify our pain so that we can be a broken mess before everybody who sees us. Jesus is inviting us to not be a victim anymore. Jesus is saying, continue to forgive. Keep on forgiving. And as we think about those who we have influence over or around us, we are not to limit our forgiveness. And then Jesus goes on to illustrate how we are to forgive through this parable we just heard. The parable, I, I, many of you probably say, man, I've heard that parable a hundred, if not a thousand times in church, Pastor. So, yeah, it's tough sometimes to preach this one. But we keep needing to hear it. I know many of you have heard this story before, but what's interesting in this story is the amount that Jesus suggests. What Jesus says here is meant to shock. In this story, he is literally telling that this king, this master, has a servant who owes him millions of dollars. And the king says to him, Hey buddy, if you don't pay, I'm selling you guys, or I'm putting you all in jail, and, and, and it's not just you, 
I'm selling you, I'm selling your wife, I'm selling your kids. If you've got a black lab, I'm selling it too until we get the debt paid. Whatever you've got. And it's clear in the story, the guy doesn't have the money, right? He can't pay it back. I mean, how is he going to come up with millions of dollars to get out of this situation? I mean, if he still had it, wouldn't he have already resolved these problems? And the story wouldn't be told here 2,000 years later. And so he begs for mercy, right? He gets down on his knees before his master and begs for mercy. Uh, please, please, just, just give me some more time. So it should also shock us <coughs> that instead, the master looks down at his servant. He has mercy upon him. He doesn't give him more time. No. What does he do? He wipes it off the books. Millions of dollars in eats it just gone. Like it had never happened. Not in part, but all of it. Every bit of it. Forgiven. Can you imagine the joy and the relief this servant experiences in this moment? He was just going to be sold into slavery or thrown into jail along with his wife, his kids, his dog, whatever he's got. He went from a lifetime of potential imprisonment and his family owing a debt they could never afford to repay to freedom, just like that, in a blink of an eye. Imagine the release of stress. Imagine the anxiety lifted off of him that he was just given. By the way, if my student loan company and my mortgage company are watching this sermon later, <laughs> let me know. You see, the twist in this story is what happens next, right? So the servant, freedom, forgiveness. And as he's, as he's walking out of this meeting with this king or this master, he sees one of his own servants. And this guy owes him the better part of nothing, relatively speaking. I mean, this, to what... He was just forgiven. We're talking like the effectively pocket change. Like you might find this in your couch or something. And what does he do? He's like Darth Vader. He grabs him, starts choking him, right? Lifts him up off the ground. You remember Star Wars? Am I the only one? <laughs> That's okay. But he starts choking him. He starts demanding repayment. You owe me. Pay up now, buddy. You owe me. What? You can't pay? Then off to jail with you. And at this point in the story, Jesus is making an emphatic point here. He's saying it's not really about the other person. Forgiveness is about me. Forgiveness is about me. Say that with me. Forgiveness is about me. Jesus is saying, Look at just how much God has forgiven you. All of your sins, all of your guilt, all of your shame. So much you could never, ever, ever put a, a, a dollar figure to what it was that he took. Yet, you can't forgive somebody else? As you have been forgiven much, can you forgive just a little in comparison? So if you're holding on to a grudge and not forgiving someone, if you are still trying to get revenge, you're forgetting that mercy first given to you. What I also want to say is happening in this moment is as we hold on to that anger, bitter, frustration, unforgiveness, when we do that, in that moment, we are not trusting God. We're not trusting God to restore. We're not trusting God to correct or redeem the wrong that has been done in our lives. So what do we, what do, we do? We want to restore, right? 
We want to be the ones who correct it. We want to show what we think is the best way to solve this wrong. But here's the deal, folks. Scripture is abundantly clear that God is the one who gets justice. Romans 12, 19. It says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to revenge. I will repay, says the Lord. I want to say that that some of you in the room today are not leaving room for God's wrath, for His justice, for, for Him to be the one who restores, for Him the one to redeem the situation. And I tell you what, I am guilty of it just as much as you. God is saying, forgiveness is about you. That forgiveness is a choice. Jesus is saying to us, give me the debt, the brokenness. And when we do give it to God, then there is an amazing transfer. We no longer call ourselves the victim, but instead we get to call ourselves the victor. And no longer are we walking as ones who are broken and shattered and injured, but we are now the living and the healed. We are no longer miserable. But when we allow God to be the one to make it right, we can be people of joy. We we no longer have to be ones who think about revenge, and instead we can live in peace because it is God who is going to restore and redeem and correct, not us. I want to say that doesn't mean that if we forgive, then we are relieving people of their consequences. There there will still be consequences. God will have justice in this life or the next. I mean, it'd be like like if if I got pulled over for speeding, right? Which hopefully never happens. But if I got pulled over for speeding and the officer comes up, knocks on the window, I roll it down, he's about to give me a ticket. I begin begging and pleading, please don't write me a ticket. Right? Right? He can forgive me for the law that I broke and still write me the ticket anyhow. That can and does happen to people. So I've heard. And I think this also happens in our lives as well. When our kids or our neighbors or our grandkids do something wrong, yes, they can ask for forgiveness, but that doesn't mean there won't still be some consequences from it. If our spouse is unfaithful to us, that doesn't mean there won't be consequences or repercussions for them because of their actions and their choices. If you're around me for any length of time, you'll probably hear me say this phrase, you chose the behavior, so you chose the consequences, right? And that works both in the good and the bad. But in the end, forgiveness is a choice. Not to set them free, but to set us free. 16th century writer Thomas Watson wrote, listen to this. We have forgiven when we strive against all thoughts of revenge. We'll not wish our enemies mischief when we wish them well. And we will grieve for their calamity. That's when we know we really have peace. When we're no longer being the ones trying to get revenge, right? And it goes so far even that, that... We even wish well upon them when things go bad for them. But again, this is forgiveness. And forgiveness is about me. Imagine if you were looking for a roommate, right? You're looking, you just, you need to make, make ends meet and you got a spare room in your house. You're, you're going to rent it out and get a roommate and, uh, it's a great way to go. We, we did this early in our marriage. We had a roommate in the lower level of our house so we could afford our mortgage. And so you meet with some people and you show them your house, right? And your final question right before they're ready to leave is, you ask them, well, tell me, what is your, what is your best personal quality? Well, the first person you meet with, you know, they, they, they seem to be an interesting candidate. And 
So you ask, well, what is your best personal quality? They look at you and think about it for a moment and go, you know, well, I'm really resentful. If you do something wrong, I excel at being bitter and letting you know just how irritated I am at you. I do it over and over and over again. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> Door, over there. Well, another person comes in. It seemed really great, right? Again, you ask, uh, well, what is your best personal quality? They respond, oh, there's so many, but, you know, I think my best personal quality is I have anger problems, and I just don't let things go. I stew over them, I hold on to them, and I carry with, the, with me all sorts of things. I mean, i got stuff I've been dragging for decades. I am great at being angry. Door. Third person finally comes, you're like, praying, it's got to be better, right? They're about to leave. You're a little hesitant, but you ask anyhow, what is your best personal quality before you go? You know, I love to get revenge on people. You have not seen revenge till you've seen me lay it down. You'd think you're on candid camera now at this point. <laughs> Which one of these roommates are you going to choose, folks? How do you think it's going to work out for you? But be honest with me here for a minute. How many of you are shacking up right now with those sins in your heart? Seriously. How many are holding those in our hearts? Living with them as our roommates. When we forgive others, we are getting rid of resentment, we are getting rid of anger and, and, and revenge living in our hearts. When we give resentment, anger, and revenge the boot, right? We kick them out of our hearts. We open up space then in our hearts for God to work in us and through us. Folks, it's time to kick those bad roommates out. Today is the day to invite God to reside more fully in your heart. God wants to work in us. When we stop identifying ourselves as the victim, we stop drinking that, that bitterness, that poison of anger and resentment, we're happier. We're healthier. We can now once again experience joy because God can live more in us and in our hearts. We want that. I want that for you. At the end of this parable is a, is a dire warning. Look how Jesus says what happens if we don't forgive. Here's how my heavenly Father will treat you. Hear this. And fear this if you won't forgive. Verse 34, Matthew 18. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers. Who's the master in the story? It's God. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is how God will treat us unless we forgive others. Another passage in scripture that, that, that hits even harder than this comes just a little bit before this. Matthew 16, 14 and 15 where it says, If you do not forgive others of their sin, your father will not forgive you of yours. No ambiguity there. So do we take these truths to heart? Do we really realize what scripture is saying? If we won't forgive others, will God forgive us? How could God reside in our hearts when your roommates are resentment, anger, bitterness, when sin is already living there? How many of us are already blocked? How many of us are hindered in our relationships? How many of us are unable to grow in our relationships because we choose not to forgive? How many of us are, are missing out on a, a deeper relationship with Christ because we're picking the wrong roommates in our heart? <coughs> 
Forgiveness doesn't always mean reconciliation. There are people in our lives we will need to forgive, but probably will never be reconciled with. Because for reconciliation to happen, repentance first has to happen. And some people, unfortunately, will never repent. Time doesn't heal all wounds, necessarily. But even then, we have to forgive and let God in and let God work. So today I want to give you an opportunity to seek forgiveness. To let go of something in your past, or maybe even something in your present, that is hindering your relationship with God. I want to give you three little guidelines here. They're not fancy, they're just simple. You can put them in your sermon notes, there's a spot for it if you'd like to write it down. The first one is simply this, to define and decide. I want you to think about those around you. Define where you need to forgive and what you need to forgive them for. It could be over money. It could be because you never received an apology. However it was that you were hurt. Whatever. Make a decision now to forgive and heal those wounds and emotions. Define what it was and decide to forgive them. The second is this, to release and depend. You cannot forgive without the power of the Holy Spirit. John 20, 22 and 23 says this, with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And if you have forgiven anyone their sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, then they are not forgiven. And what I want to point out out of this passage is that the Holy Spirit has to be present in our lives in order for us to have the power to forgive. The power depends upon God and not on your efforts. And so if you are truly willing, God will help you to release and forgive but you have to depend upon him we need to humble ourselves we need to cry out to God we need to say God please help me forgive and then let the Holy Spirit work through us the third one is simple super simple it's just simply following through and simply obeying. If you are having a prompting in, our, in your spirit by the Holy Spirit, if we see a person or know a person, someone we, we truly need to forgive, are we willing to obey that prompting of the Holy Spirit? Or will you continue going on, trying to ignore it, and drinking that poison every day? I want you to know that when we think about the relationships around us, a lot of us are like this. We're, we're broken, we're shattered in our relationships. And we're looking for redemption. We're looking for somebody to pay the debt. We're looking for wholeness and to be made complete again. We're looking for God to put the pieces back together again. We're looking for God to reconcile that relationship or at least help us forgive that person who did us wrong. And I want to tell you that Jesus Christ, he, he died for that debt. He died for that sin. He died for that thing. That horrible thing that may have happened to you or that horrible thing that maybe you did to somebody else, in fact. And God is asking us, God is inviting us, encouraging us, prompting us by His Holy Spirit to redeem us so that He can come into our lives and put those broken pieces back together again so that we can be whole people once again. And this is exactly what Christ did on the cross for us, for you, for me, for all of us. He came to reconcile, to repair a broken relationship. But not only to repair the broken relationship between us and our God, but also to help us repair that broken relationship with us and someone else. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you 
need to give to Christ and say, I know I was wronged, but I choose forgiveness. Forgiveness is about me. Quit drinking the poison. Trust God to work and see amazing things happen. Let's pray.